Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ADA's Young Lawyer Division Women in the Professions Teleconference, Jumping into Politics, a Primer on How to Run for Office. Um, I'm Shelley Molyneux, and I'll be your moderator today. We here at YLD have noticed that more and more women, especially young lawyers, are interested in running for office, but often don't know where to begin. So this teleconference is designed to encourage you, if you are interested, by giving you the specific concrete steps you can take to begin your foray into running for office. Basically, how you get started. This topic was driven by the belief that although we each may have our own individual political preferences and beliefs, one thing we can all agree on is we need more women in politics, and more women in politics benefits us all, men and women. I know we're all aware of the uh, disparity between men and women in politics, so we're looking to close that gap. To that end, we have two amazing women on our panel today, Kimberly Mitchum Rasmussen, founder and director of a nonpartisan organization that seeks to train women to run for office, and Victoria Nieve, a young lawyer who made a recent and resoundingly successful trip into the political arena. Before I begin, I want to encourage you to ask questions. At the end, I have left time to ask our speakers questions, and I think so often Women fear their questions aren't relevant or typical, and so we don't ask them. But I want you to speak up. Ask the questions. If you're thinking it, chances are so is someone else. So if we're not talking about it, something you had a question about, maybe we should be, and it will be our next teleconference. So please, voice your thoughts. I'm so excited to introduce our first speaker, Kimberly. Kimberly is a professional, an advocate, an entrepreneur, a mother, just to name a few of her life roles. In 2010, Kimberly founded the Political Institute for Women. And the Political Institute for Women, like I said, is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that trains women to run for office, pursue careers in the political sector, and be vocal, effective political advocates in their communities. In addition, Kimberly was inspired by her daughter to create the Girls in Politics Initiative to instill the concept of a political leadership in girls early on in their lives. To this end, her organization has developed summer camps and school programs, specifically designed to encourage our girls to strive to be political leaders. Kimberly aims through her organization to empower women and empower girls. Her goal is not to advance a certain political agenda, but merely to encourage and promote all women to use their voice and guidance on how to make their voice heard, which is a concept I think we are all interested in. Welcome, Kimberly. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Can you, you guys just, hear me uh, there? jump right in. Jump right in? Okay. So I'm yeah. going to set my time up for 20 minutes here because, honestly, I'm working from our candidate campaign uh, prep workbook, and um, we usually do it in an hour and a half. I can I can shorten it and, and highlight the, the important points, and um, Shelly's going to also send you guys a copy of it. But I love what I do so much, and I get so enthused that I could easily spend more than 20 minutes talking about this. So let me set my timer <laughs> so I can respect the time today. Um, and I'm going to just jump right in. Uh, and we'll start with the decision to run. And I really like to examine the decision to run when I work with a candidate. And the reason I do is because I think that um, the reason you run can, one, inform the issues that you will tackle um, and help us build your platform. Because whenever I build a platform with a candidate, it needs to be authentic. I think that voters can see that and it resonates with you. I mean, even distasteful <laughs> authentic messages resonate with voters and you know we often like people that you wouldn't imagine would get elected but it's because their message resonated with the voter and at the end of the day that's your goal you've got to resonate with the voter so that they walk into um, that booth and pull the handle or push the push the button or circle the the oval for you as a candidate um and so i really start with making a list of the reasons you want to run why is it you are doing this and uh, a lot of folks, when you reach out and you ask them for their support, especially uh, people in the community that are influential and who are your power brokers in the community, they're going to want to know why you want to run. Um, and then I also like the candidate to do an inventory of their beliefs, because often our beliefs inform our platform. Um, when you start to look at issues like choice, for example, that's it's clearly belief-based, um, and it's clearly an issue that decides elections, and it's an issue that voters will either uh, support you or not support you based on. It's one of those wedge issues um, rooted in our beliefs, and so it's important to examine your beliefs. Another reason I think it's really important when you run to examine your beliefs is because despite what we say sometimes, our beliefs generally inform what we've done, and when you run for office, 
you are running based on your personal record. Now, when you run for re-election, you're going to be running based on your legislative record. Um, or if you're, you know, in an executive position, you're going to be running based on your, your the, the record of your administration that you lead. But people judge you based on your past decisions and based on where you've spent your time. Um, your beliefs also really do inform where you spend your time and where you spend your money. And um, for the most part, we all are leaving a trail on the Internet. Um, if nothing else, the events that you've attended, the organizations that you're associated with, um, you know, simple things like if you're a marathoner, you're a runner, you're active, um, and you care about the outdoors, then um, you as a track association, if you qualify, keeps a record of that kind of thing. So, again, you want to examine your beliefs because those really do guide what you actually do. You know, we say one thing or we say we'd like to do this one thing, but, you know, generally it's, it's the beliefs and the things you commit to that really show up in your list of what, I, you know, your list of things you've done. Um, and then qualifications. We want to really look at your qualifications. I do not believe um, – that there is really one specific path into politics. We've got a lot of successful advocates um, who make the transition into politics. We've got teachers, we've got attorneys, we've got business women. Uh, I think it really is um, what you've decided to do and how you apply the skills you have um, to that job. And sometimes the job you're doing or the work you're doing brings you to political office. It brings you, you know, front and center. Um, like with advocates, for example, they work and work and work with elected officials and work for years with state legislatures or county commissions or with, con with, with the Congress to get bills passed or just to, um, you know, lessen the impact of the bills that are being passed on the con on the constituency they serve. So if it's a service organization, you know, um, a great example of this is, you know, an, a Planned Parenthood, you know, they do a lot of lobbying to lessen the impact of what's happening in Congress on the services that they're able to provide. You know, can this person use their um, their their benefits uh, to get services at a clinic? Um, and we're not even talking about the issues, uh, the, the issue of choice and, and abortions. We're talking about simply just getting breast cancer screenings. Um, so your qualifications, you want to take a look at them. Um, and don't ever let anyone say to you that you're not qualified or that you don't have the necessary experience. For one, if you really want to run for office and you don't have the experience now, go get it. Make a list of what you, need, what you feel like you need to have, and you can speak to people who have served in this position or people who work in politics. You can always call our office. I'm, I'm always available to give you a really um, candid, a, a candid assessment, and um, I'm going to be candid with you. I'm going to be, be blunt with you simply because the voters will be, your opponents will be. Uh, again, you can do anything you want to if you are adequately prepared. And that is, you know, again, having a, an honest assessment of where you are. Um, if you don't have a skill, you can certainly go and acquire that skill. Um, and let's see, we'll move on beyond qualifications to the best candidate. Um, you want to take a look at what this role involves, you know, whatever it is you've decided to run for. And in your mind, um, and on paper, and we do all of this on paper, too. We, um, I'm, I'm big about putting things on paper. Um, for one, it just keeps you organized. And two, I don't think it's valid unless I've got it in writing. Uh, you know, it, it's not a plan until you put it, put it uh, pen to paper. Um, so your idea of what the best candidate looks like, um, and I think this goes, goes it speaks to conf confidence, too. But what does the best candidate for this, this role look like? And, you know, in places where there are additional skills you need to acquire or things you need to work on, then you can do that, you know, and you can put together what, for you, is the profile of the best candidate for this job. And I want you to go out feeling like you are, because you're going to need to say that to voters. You are going to be on a stage at some point or at a forum at some point, and there are going to be other candidates in the primary, if this is, a, if a, if this is um, an election that you've got a primary and a general, and you are going to use the words, um, <laughs> I'm the best candidate for this, this job. You know, I'm the most qualified person here, or I'm, I'm, I am your best option. Hopefully, you won't say it that way. That sort of sounds like it's like, you know, it's, it's, something's about to explode and you can de-rig the bomb. But, you know, you want to say, this is why. Um, and it should be convincing. Like, believe it or not, I've actually worked with candidates, and we've done the first event or forum, and they didn't sound confident. 
you know, and I'm like, if you don't believe in yourself, no one else is going to. Um, so you, if anyone else, you know, like anybody else on stage, you, you need to exude that confidence that says to them, yeah, I'm, I'm the woman for the job. Um, and so then we're going to move on to section two, the skills needed to serve. Um, when you look at an elected official, and, and there, are different, there are different skills um, required based on the, the type of office you seek. Um, that's one of the things that we seek to, seek to do with women is to really peel back the onion so that they're really looking at political office in a technical way. Um, you know, every elected office has a different set of um, requirements or skills that you're going to need to serve in that job. But there's some that are pretty universal um, because you are going to be dealing with other legislators. You are going to be dealing with voters. And then you're, are, you're going to be dealing with the special interests. You're going to be dealing with um, your, you know, your business community as well. So the first and most important skill that I think that anyone running for public office has to have, it's commu a communication skills. It's the ability to effectively communicate with people. This does not need to be you being an extrovert necessarily. Like a lot of folks um, believe that all elected officials are extroverts or anybody who excels at elected office is an extrovert. So we have a lot of women. Um, I'm, my Myers-Briggs type is INTJ. I'm actually introverted. Um, if you're introverted or even shy, it does not mean that you can't run for political office. You can. Um, someone sent me a, a, a an article that said something like the power, the secret power of introverts. And I was like, why are you sending that to me? I don't, I don't think I'm not powerful because I'm an introvert. I just recharge differently. And I prefer small intimate groups or to be alone, but I certainly can do a crowd and I can definitely lead. Um, so I thought that was kind of like bunk, like I'm not, not, not that I'm not powerful. I, I thought it was ridiculous. But you, if you are introverted or if you are shy or if you are having some misgivings, um, don't. You just need to be a good communicator. Um, and that's essential. Uh, whether you're standing in a big room getting something across to a big group or you're in a small caucus um, working with other legislators and leading, you know, from the front of a table of, of five or six. Um, and I think now more than ever, the ability to really communicate what to expect to voters is essential from our elected officials. Um, I've heard multiple times over the last few weeks that um, the, the Democratic Party had a, an issue with communicating um, and, a, and, a, and a PR problem or a messaging problem. And I do believe that to a degree. You've got to be able to effectively communicate and not just to one group of constituents, but to multiple groups of constituents. And I don't think that anymore that we live in really homogenous societies or, or like a really homogenous communities. Um, I think that for the most part, most communities are pretty diverse. Um, you may, because of gerrymandering, honestly, have a district that's majority Republican or majority Democrat, but within that that, that district, you're going to have a, a cross-section of people, professionals, you know, working class people, people, you know, who work hourly wage, and you're going to need to message to all of those folks and feel comfortable talking to them. Um, your analytical skills, and you're a group of young lawyers, so your analytical skills, um, we don't need to linger on that, but you are going to be required to really process a lot of complex information. Uh, you don't have to have been exposed to this when you run. I, I tell candidates all the time, you don't have to be a policy expert. We're not electing policy wonks. Policy wonks work at think tanks and advise candidates on policy. They don't typically run. You can get that information. You just need to be able to process it and process it not just with the immediate goal in mind, but you've got to think long term. How does this issue in the long term impact my constituents, uh, and it can impact them in just a number of ways, you know, um, but you've got to be able to think through these issues. And then again, when it comes back to the communication, be able to communicate this to your constituents um, once you're an elected official. And a lot of this, this starts when you run. Um, it's, it, you know, it's like a trial. It's a lot of it starts when you run. You're going to be looking at issues that voters care about, 
and talking to them about what you would like to do and what you expect. Another thing that I'm really big on um, is communicating, you know, expectations and, and communicating to voters what the solution looks like. Um, and I started doing that when I was um, beginning to work with congressional clients because they're being reelected every two years. And two years just is not enough time to get very much done. But we've moved into this age where information is distributed so quickly that um, you've got to get ahead of things. And, you know, I always say, let's be clear to our constituents what the solutions are going to look like and especially how long this could take. You know, is this a two-year proposition? Is this a four-year proposition? You know, um, it may not be an issue that you can solely deal with as, as in your position, but who is it that you're going to bring together to work on this issue? Are you going to bring in the county? Are you going to bring in the state? Um, do we want to look at some public-private partnerships? But talk to voters about this so that they're clear about what, what success looks like and what you're going to look like as you're solving this problem along the way. And most problems are complicated. They can't be solved in one term. You can't do it all on your own. You're going to need other legislators to work with you or other elected officials to work with you. Um, so analytical skills are key, but you guys have got that under control. Um, your project management skills. Now, when you run for office, I don't want anybody to be their own campaign manager. Even when you've been a campaign manager, you shouldn't be. Um, I had a candidate that I worked with in Mississippi who had managed many, many, many campaigns, and he um, was called in to take a look at a campaign um, or look, look at a race and to, to help someone who was considering getting into the race decide if they would get into the race or not. And he thought, you know what, it looks like a great opportunity to, for me. So I believe it was the first district in Mississippi. So he called me and he said, I'm running. Um, and, you know, obviously I can get the skeleton together, but, you know, the work it takes to campaign in a district is almost like a full-time job. So he couldn't do it himself. So I say that to say, the most skilled political operative does not run their own campaign if, in fact, they do decide to run. But you really do need to be able to manage um, everything going on around you because the buck stops with you. Ultimately, you are responsible. You are the candidate. So you really need to develop early on um, project management skills and the ability to, you know, be able to put all the right pieces into place. Most folks when they run for office, and you guys are attorneys, so it's, it's very likely going to be the case for you, you're still doing your full-time job and your full-time life. Um, generally, folks who run for Congress take a leave, but that makes sense because if you win, you're going to go into Congress and you'll have a full-time salary. Below Congress and outside of executive positions, mayors, governors, county executives, county CEOs, county chairs, um, beyond that, generally, there is not enough money involved for you to quit your job. They are part-time jobs. Even though they may demand your time full-time, they are actually part-time positions when it comes to pay. So most folks are going to have to continue working. Um, and so, again, you're just going to have to develop some project management skills. You're going to have to manage your life, your kids, um, your office, uh, your campaign, your staffers. Um, you know, sadly, when an argument breaks out between maybe a staffer and a campaign manager, you're probably going to hear about it. Um, so project management skills are going to be really important. And then if you run and you go into a legislative position, um, you're likely going to be interested in being a committee chair or serving on a committee. Um, and sometimes, you know, first-time congressmen, freshman congressmen, or freshman legislators do get put in chair positions. Often it's if you've got a background, um, well, honestly, it could be who you know, um, but if you've got a background and, um, you know, someone really believes you're, you, you are the right person, you could be put in a committee chair position. Committees, most, most of them in most states, you do have a committee staff as well. So you're going to have your office staff um, and your committee staff. So again, project management skills, really, really important. But most women are used to keeping a lot of balls in the air at one time anyway. Um, your negotiating skills, uh, if, especially if you're going to be in a state legislature or on a county commission or a, a member of Congress, you got to negotiate. I mean, and I honestly just approach life as a big negotiation. Everything's negotiable. Um, nothing is fixed. We can find a way to get to where we need to be. So 
So um, most of you negotiate every day, all day long as attorneys, so you get it. Um, team building skills. And I have to tell you, this is something that I personally am learning, learning, um, I'm really developing right now um, because the right team can take you everywhere. The wrong team or even one weak team member can really cause you stress and, and waste resources and waste time. Don't be afraid when you run for office to get rid of someone who is a weak link on your team because that election is coming no matter what. The one thing on a campaign that you can never, ever have enough of is time. So don't vacillate. Don't sit and think about it too long. If your gut is telling you this is someone you need to replace, you should do it. Um, and, you know, sit down with someone you trust and talk about your options, map out your options. Um, but I never, uh, when I do go in and I consult on campaigns, often I'm the hatchet woman and I do come in and um, fire and replace folks for some of my clients. Um, but I, I try not to let this linger beyond a week. And we do everything in one week increments with two meetings every week. Because if something doesn't get done by the Wednesday deadline, we can put extra bodies on it to get it done before Friday. Because again, you never have enough time. So being a good um, team builder and starting with the campaign is essential. Because when you get to your office, wherever it is you land and wherever you are serving, you're gonna need to put together a good team. Now this is something that um, I want you to think about when you run and when you serve. A lot of folks will go in and get rid of the people who served the previous legislator in that position, if it's a legislative position. That's usually the most common. But you need to think about that because so much of the business and what goes on in the state legislature and especially in Congress, you know, the people who've been there before have a lot of institutional knowledge. When I work with members of Congress, I advise them not to fire everyone. <laughs> Um, you know, unless there was a party change and, you know, you went from a Democrat to a Republican or a Republican to a Democrat in that seat, the people who've been there on the Hill, you know, they know simple things like where the bathroom is. And I can promise you, um, I spent a few weeks up in D.C. getting my um, candidates settled. A lot of them didn't know where the bathrooms were. You know, so like you can see freshmen wandering around and they're like, you know, the bathroom is, you looking for the bathroom? They don't know where the bathroom is, you know, or in Longworth, are you looking for the cafeteria? You know, um, I know the, the, the chef at the Longworth, in the Longworth cafeteria, so when we take our girls for summer camp and we spend the day at the Capitol for Camp Congress DC, you know, I know the cafeteria guy, so I can call him ahead and say, I'm bringing 25 little girls down you know, can you have these things out? Because I'm pretty sure there's going to be a run on your chicken strips and chicken nuggets. But things like that just can make your transition in the office so much smoother. So it's really important to get to know, um, you know, the people who've worked there before and consider retaining some of them. Um, now, the tools you need to run for office, and I'll run through this really quick because I can actually hear my timer going off in the other room. Um, and the tools you need to run for office, a broad network. And you guys know what that is. Um, you definitely need a broad network. You're going to need the name recognition simply because you got to get enough people to vote for you to be elected. Um, you want to have a track record and some roots in your community. You want people to know that you're someone who understands the community it needs and you live there and you have served in the community in whatever capacity. And in any way you've served, don't forget to highlight that. Fundraising prowess is very important. Um, don't let people tell you that you can run for office and do it with no money. And the people you see who run and seemingly don't raise a lot of money and win, you need to really do some research on that race and figure out what other advantage they had. Sometimes it just could be that they were the best in a really poor field. It doesn't matter. A win is a win. But make sure you understand all the dynamics of how that person won without a lot of money. A lot of advocates you'll see run and not have to raise a lot of money, but it's because they've got huge deep network and roots and all these other advocacy groups that are their natural allies have really pounded the ground for them. So if you've got like 500 solid volunteers, then you don't need the thousands of dollars to push your message out across, you know, um, the, the, the internet and television and radio because you've got mouths and feet on the ground for you. 
Um, you want influential allies. You guys get this. Influential allies can bring other people to the table who will support you. Um, they can give folks who don't know you a, a confidence in your abilities because if this influential person supports you, then you're probably a pretty good, a good candidate or a decent person. Um, and, you know, they can help bring in more money. And don't ever be afraid to ask your network to help you raise money because you're going to need it. Um, and then you're going to create your base. Who am I? What do I believe? How, how am I going how am I going to pull together this coalition of voters who are going to support me? But creating your base is going to be really important. Um, building your network is going to be important. You're going to build that network throughout your race. So don't just think I've got my network. You know, you're going to keep building it. And also every person you meet is a potential donor. So you're going to keep building your fundraising database throughout this whole time that you're running. Okay. And acquiring skills. Um, some of them you'll acquire organically. The more you speak, typically the better you get at it. Um, and then if you aren't settled in the community or you're newer to the community and you haven't planted roots, if you're thinking about running right now, start thinking about what you need to do to plant roots right now. Um, building your brand, that's pretty simple. Who am I? What do I believe in? And usually your beliefs sort of inform your brand. And, you know, again, you look back at the things you've done, you know, if you're always, always, always the person who's volunteering for this organization that serves kids, then you're going to be known, whether you realize it or not, as a person who's an advocate for children. Um, choosing your race. Really quickly, when you choose your race, think about what you bring to the table and what you bring to the table now. Don't feel like that you've got to jump in because you're not going to have another opportunity. There are like 88,000 elected positions in this country. At the local level, at the state level, there are going to be a lot of opportunities for you. Don't always think that you necessarily have to run for office to lead politically because there are a lot of appointed positions that can put you in a leadership position, put you in charge of an agency or an administration, and put you in charge of resources that you can then direct to really help people. Because I'm assuming that everyone wanting to run who's on this call is doing it because you want to help people. So again, think about the other ways you can lead. Being appointed to a commission or a board or being appointed to run an agency is another leadership option for you politically. And we need to build a really broad and deep network of women leaders in the political sector and in government, okay? Um, and the campaign process is pretty simple. Um, you're going to attend a training, if you haven't already, and you can attend multiple trainings. Um, attend a training, file your paperwork. Um, the Elections Commission's website for your state is going to be a tremendous resource for you. It can be a little bit daunting, but click through those pages and read and read and read and call them. I always tell folks, call the Elections Commission and ask them for help. Most of them have free courses that you can take, uh, just an abundance of materials you can download or have mailed to you that you can read so that you're really well informed about the process in your state and because the constitution gives states the right to determine the right to determine how elections are run every state does it differently but again there's so much information there then you're of course going to open your checking account so you'll be open for business ready to, ready to raise money the two people you need to hire campaign manager fundraiser right off the bat the fundraiser is going to be worth their weight in gold because you need a person who's dedicated to raising money for you 24 hours a day seven days a week uh, just a, a technical tip here get your page your website up early and if you have nothing but your bio and a great photo of you your family and your pets and a link on the top really clearly visible that says contribute and then just a bullet point of your your platform bullet points of your platform Get that open so that you can raise money 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You don't have to get the full-on website with all the tabs completed up. Just a landing page for the campaign is really enough. You also need a place where people can volunteer to sign up to volunteer um, on that page. Um, purchase your campaign management software. You guys can do some homework on that. Just Google campaign management software and a number of options come up. Um, purchase your list of voters. You can purchase it on the state. Some of these campaign management software um, tools have the option to purchase the, the list. Um, purchase your campaign website, get that up and going. A lot of these campaign management software companies now have a plugin for your page. And so your page is running on the front and their whole operation is running behind the scenes. They're great. Um, 
choose one that works for you. And you should also know how to run it. You don't have to know, like, the, get into the weeds about how to run it. But you need to be, be able to do simple things like go in there and add a donor contact. Um, and then when your basic internal operations for the campaign are in place, you're going to schedule your kickoff for the event. Um, so that was just a quick and dirty 20, probably 25 minutes. I'm so sorry, Victoria, I cut into your time. 25 minutes of what it is um, that you are going to be doing. Um, and you are going to get this handout from Shelly. Um, it's, let's see how many pages here. It's 10 pages. So I covered a, I covered yes, a lot. Yes, we will email it today. out at the end. Yes, she'll send it to you. Perfect. So thank you so much and apologies to you, Victoria. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Kimberly, thank you so much. That was um, a lot of information, but I love the way you had it broken out and kind of easy to follow steps. So I will get all that information to everyone. And um, I'm going to jump right in for Victoria. I'm so excited about Victoria. She was literally just born into the Texas House of Representatives less than two weeks ago. She took on the incumbent in her district and won. Uh, Victoria graduated from law school in 2009. And what she has done since graduating is astounding. She began her career as a litigation attorney working as a complex commercial litigation, in complex commercial litigation. And she then began her own litigation practice in Dallas. And Victoria believes that we have a duty to stand up for those without a voice, which I think is a goal we all agree with. She works with the elderly. She was on the board of the Dallas Hispanic Bar Association and the Southeast Dallas Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Board. And we want to hear what led Victoria to deciding to run and what were some of the obstacles she faced and how she overcame them. Victoria, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here. And thank you, Kimberly. That was great information. And um, so I'm just going to dive just quickly into my background. And then I want to get into some of the practical aspects and uh, then leave some time for questions, because there are a lot of things I learned as a first time candidate um, that um, I want to share with you all as you consider your run for office. And so I grew up, just quick background on me, I grew up in a low-income neighborhood in Dallas, the barrio we call it. Um, my dad came as an immigrant from a small town in Mexico, and he came with a sixth grade education and a dream. And he worked very hard. My mom worked very hard. And um, I had an opportunity to go to an all-girls school in Dallas, Ursuline Academy of Dallas, um, which was an incredible experience. It was on the wealthy part of town. And so driving that hour to um, Ursuline and seeing the mansion surrounding the school really opened up my eyes to the wealth gap in our city. And so I knew that I had a responsibility from a very young age, I knew that I had a responsibility to use my skills um, as an advocate and to, you know, to be able to serve and fight for our community. And so um, I, I worked as a, a litigation attorney in the complex commercial litigation department of Wild Gottschall and Mangies and uh, then started my practice. And just one thing with firms, I just want to throw out uh, for those of you who are working at firms. Um, if you're considering a run to, to check with your firm, um, whether they would have a, any issues, any conflicts issues, de depending on the type of um, office that you're going to be seeking. I have a friend who is interested in running, um, who works in a securities firm, who or who worked in a securities firm, and there was no way that they were going to, you know, be okay with uh, my friend running for office. So, um, so he left the firm. And so just, I just want you to take that into consideration. I, ha I have my own firm now, um, but our race was very exciting. Um, we, we unseated a Republican incumbent in the most expensive house race in Texas in a year where um, I think Republicans all across the country were sweeping and winning races. And so but I'm very proud as a Democratic candidate that we had lots of independent and Republican supporters backing our campaign. So it was a very different, it wasn't, we didn't run a campaign based on party, it was based on issues. And, I, and, I, and that's how I'm approaching this legislative session, because I really think we need to start working together and try to find areas of common, common ground. So whether you're Republican, Democrat, independent, we need more women in all levels of government. Um, in the Texas House specifically, there are only 29 women out of 150 state representatives, 29. I'm, I'm very honored to be one of the 29, but we have a lot of work to do. And there's 2017, and just this is just one thing that's just really astounding. So I hope that y'all run um, in your states and your local cities. So let's get into some of the practical 
um, aspects of it. Fundraising that y'all heard Kimberly talked about is crucial. You've got to um, look into, I didn't have a person that was specifically, you know, fundraising, but if you do look at um, hiring a fundraiser, look at their fee structure, some based, uh, charge based on a percentage of what you raise, others uh, charge a flat fee. Um, I had our internal team, I had an intern um, who helped pull call lists for me. And just real quick on what a call list is, um, you need to look at your, consider looking at your, your circle. And um, there, I'm sure there's stuff online about this, but first make a list of 100 people that you know and how much you think that you can ask them to donate. Um, and you need to start with your closest list. Then you look at individuals who, um, have some sort of shared interest with you, um, whether it's on a particular issue, and then you start, you know, fundraising from those. But what call time is and what call lists are, are have somebody help you research the donor history. There are specific websites on the, if you're in Texas, the Texas Ethics Commission, I think, has it. And then if you're running for Congress or federal, um, look at the, and even if you're not, look at the Federal uh, Elections Commission. You can type in a person's name and find out if they voted to state or congressional or even, you know, candidates who, um, you know, ran for president. And you can see who they donated and what amount. So if somebody is a regular donor of $1,000 and you make a phone call to ask them to donate, you don't want to ask for $250. You want to ask them for the $1,000. And so that vote history is really, I mean, that donor history is really important. Um, Email blast, so that's another way that we fundraise. We had regular communication through email and on our social media, um, but we used a particular uh, tool called NGP, and it what it does is it compiles all of your emails in there, and of course, you know, get permission from the folks that you're adding to your email list, and you can send email blasts, and it will track how many people actually donate, and the amounts and how successful an email was, um, how many people actually clicked and opened it, or and, and there are different tools for emails and fundraising tools. And so, Act Blue is another one that's out there for progressive candidates. I'm, I'm sure there are lots, but um, I, I specifically use NGP. There's a monthly fee, um, but you can accept credit card payments and then put those links on your website. So. Fundraising, fundraising is absolutely critical. The next, um, and I think the most important thing and which helped us in our um, race sort of unseat um, is, is the field. So you need a really good field team. Um, you need to consider analyzing precinct by precinct um, the vote history in your district. So whether you're running for a for state house, for example, in ours, we had 53, 54 precincts, which are pretty much neighborhoods that are um, drawn up, and um, there's a specific border, and you can run searches based on their voter turnout. Did they vote, for example, in the Democratic primary? Have they voted in a Republican primary? Um, how do they regularly vote? Or, you know, is the last time that they voted back in 2008? And so then you can run, and you can get this information from your local elections department. They typically send it in spreadsheets. If you're a Democratic candidate, I would suggest contacting your statewide Democratic um, Party. They have, in, in Texas, the Texas Democratic Party sells um, access to the Texas VAN, which is a voter activation network. And you can run searches based on voter history, based on um, age based on lots of things. And so um, that helps you determine which doors you're going to knock on because those one-on-one -on -one conversations at the door are extremely critical. You can run a campaign and run things on social media. You can make phone calls, but data shows that the most effective way of earning a, a, an individual's vote is by talking to them in person at their door. And so um, I will... <laughs> I shared on our social media, feel free to follow us at Victoria for Texas. Um, I, I'm not sure, I'll have to see if we posted pictures, but at events I've shown the tennis shoes that I wore out from knocking on doors and pounding the pavement. My shoes the day right before election day on November 7th, it was pouring down in Dallas. 
And we were out knocking on doors, going up and down apartment complexes and just running through puddles to try to get as many people, uh, our last minute voters to, you know, know where to go vote. My, my, shoe, my tennis shoes fell apart. And I, I share the, that with people because I want people to know how much work it takes. Like, don't expect to just um, don't expect that somebody's going to vote for you because they get a mailer from you. They, they, they need to hear from you. And uh, for me, it was really important to listen, to, to listen to what issues were important to our constituents, to our voters. And um, so that now that we're here in office, we're able to implement some ideas. We're, uh, you know, and able to focus on the issues that are important to to our community. And so knocking on doors is really critical. Voter registration is another key component. Um, we worked very hard, and, we, and I'll get into, like, the importance of allies, like Kimberly was talking about, but voter registration, we had teams who were going to the colleges to register students. We had, as we were knocking on doors, our field team, we made sure that our canvassers were deputized by our local elections department to be able to register people to vote on the spot. Um, look at the laws in your state here in Texas. Um, you have to be you have to become a bo voter deputy registrar, volunteer deputy registrar. Go through a training um, so that you know the laws and how to register voters, and you can register them on the spot. And then you have to tur turn in the card a certain number of days. You can give them cards to register to vote, but you don't know if they're going to turn it back in or not. And so then you have that communication with that voter and you're able to keep in touch with them. So voter registration is critical. Um, let's see. Precinct chairs. Um, there are, if you're running for a partisan race, there are Democratic precinct chairs and there are, Dem and there are Republican precinct chairs. A precinct chair's responsibility is to help get out the vote in their local precinct, which is their neighborhood. Precinct chairs here in Texas run for office and um, they're actually on the ballot as well. Um, in our particular race, I, I suggest communicating and getting to know your precinct chairs because they will help um, connect you with the key um, voices in the neighborhood, folks who will spread the word about you, who can help uh, host little coffees in their homes, you know, things like that. So precinct chairs are really important. And Polling, if you're going to, if you're, if you're running in a race as big as ours, so ours, it was, it was a 55,000 vote turnout. And um, we looked at the historical data based on which election year, um, as we were analyzing whether we could, whether, you know, we had a chance of winning. And um, the incumbent that, I ran in a swing district, so um, in 2008, there was a Democratic state representative. Um, he lost the seat in 2010 when there was some there was an interim map in place because of redistricting lawsuit, which I won't get into. But um, so the Republican incumbent had had served for three terms. This would have been his fourth. And in 2012, the last presidential election, he barely won by a very narrow margin of 50.8 to 49.2. It was a 50,000 vote turnout with a margin of about 800 um, and something votes. And so I, um, we knew that it's winnable. It's if, if you can earn the votes of individuals and make sure that, you know, you reach across party lines. And um, we knew that it was winnable if, if it was, you know, if it was that close in the last presidential year. And so this presidential year, um, we worked very, very hard. Um, and folks, e even, I mean, we had people who were voting for President Trump, and we were the only Democrat on their ballot that they voted for um, because we ran a very issues-based campaign. And so I'm very proud that we were able to earn the votes of um, folks from all parties. But um, it's, I think it's important to do that, and I think that's one of the strengths of women candidates. And I'm going to try to hurry here because I see we only have a few more minutes. But if 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 you're going to do polling, just know that they're expensive. Um, if it's a race as big as ours, I highly recommend it and get an experienced pollster and get recommendations uh, before you hire a polling company. Um, let me see what else. There's a lot of other stuff, but I'll 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 go ahead and end there to open it up or. If, you know, if there are any questions, or I'm not sure what the next steps are here. Thank you, Victoria, um, and congratulations again on your successful run. Uh, Lisa, we're ready for questions. 
Yes, ma'am. If you would like to ask a question, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. Again, that is star one on your telephone keypad to ask a question, and we'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. You do have a question from Renata Castro. Hi, um, this is Renata Castro. I am an immigration attorney, a solo practitioner here in Miami, Florida, and I actually ran for city commissioner in the city of Margate last year. And the question that I have is for Victoria. Um, one of the challenges that I found, Victoria, was the fact that it was clearly an immigrant um, in a city that historically um, was run by um, white majorities. And I'm not trying to make this a race discussion, but I wonder if you had the same issue and how you overcame it. Yeah, so one of the – so I'm Latina of, of Mexican-American descent, and what I think people um, see what's sort of unique about our race is that our district is not what some would call a, quote, Latino district. Our the demographics of all districts I'll share are there are about 50% of white voters, 35% Latinos of voting age population, and 15% African American. And so what was important for us is, you know, when you think of the messaging, is it's, it's, we're running to represent everybody, right, regardless of the color of our skin. And so I, I wanted to make sure that people under, understood that, that I, I – um, so I, and I didn't want to be viewed as just the Latina candidate. I was running to represent everybody. But at the same time, the Latino community was a critical, um, they had not had somebody knock on their door or engage them. Um, and the numbers of Latino voters significantly increased and helped us win our race. And so um, I think it's a matter, for me, it's a matter of bridge building with different groups. Um, you know, different. We we worked with. Um, I, you know, I had a chance to go visit um, a synagogue. I had a chance to visit a Muslim. Um, um, you know, the Muslim mosque. Ter mosque. I'm sorry, I was like, yeah, a Muslim mosque. Well, I visited uh, one, so that's why I learned. Yes, yes, and I I should know. I'm just blanking out. And um and just you know we visited with the NAACP. We. Uh, worked with groups of all backgrounds to uh, see where we could find common ground. And so I think just coalition building is really, really important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And your next question comes from Tina Patterson. run yet I've considered I've taken some local trainings around here in my area um, and I took one last year specifically for women but um, I'm I just transitioned I'm a solo attorney now and one of the things I'd like to do is kind of um, until I think I'm ready to make my run uh, try to get work on a campaign through like legal consulting and knowing the things I know and how to uh, bring that skill to a campaign what do you suggest um, lawyers do to kind of make a niche in that field, I guess, so to say, you know, um, how can we take what we know, apply it to a campaign before running and, you know, build experience for when we do decide to make that run? So I want to, part of your, the first, the very first part of what you said was cut off. Um, what was the first part of what you said? This is Kimberly. Okay, sorry. Yeah, the first part of what I was saying was just about my own background and how I've had this training locally regarding um, elections and how to run, how to build a base, things like that. But um, how to take that knowledge, work in a campaign through, you know, as kind of like a campaign lawyer, but also consulting with what I know um, and building experience that way to eventually run in the future. So in my in my experience, um, if you are going to run as a candidate, I think that you will, again, I, and Victoria gave you guys lots of technical information, and I'm sure a lot of that, um, it sounds like she did a lot of work with seasoned political operatives and folks that gave her a lot of great advice, and they implemented a really good plan. 
when you get a really good team in place, a lot of the mechanics of it, they will bring to the table, and they should. If you're planning to run right now, what you should be doing is building a base. If you want to work on campaigns and be a cam, you know, be an attorney that represents campaigns, that's a different thing. And you know, then of course, trying to meet more people and get positions in that capacity on campaigns, you should do. But if your goal is to actually run, then you should be out building your base. It's the voters that you're really going going to need to get to know um, and make yourself a, a known quantity in your community. Um, so I think that would be a better use of your time. The mechanics of campaigning, you don't really need to get into the weeds of that. A lot of that, again, a good seasoned team will bring to the table. And, you know, you will learn um, because you'll live it for a good 18, you know, months, depending on when you jump into a race. And can I add something to that? This is Victoria. Um, one way if you want to get experience is I would volunteer on a campaign. Um, to go knocking on doors so you can see what it actually feels like to walk up to a stranger's door and make a pitch and listen. And so then you can see, you know, what you're going to have to be doing as a candidate. So um, I would suggest volunteering on a campaign. Okay, thank you. And again, that star one to ask a question. While we're waiting, um, we have a couple more minutes here, so this is Shelly again. I, I have a question. Um, women are known for falling victim to what we call the imposter syndrome, and so both of you can speak to this. Victoria, did you experience this, and if so, how did you overcome it? And Kimberly, how do you counsel and or teach women to kind of overcome the imposter syndrome, i.e., you belong there, you're good enough, you can do it? Um. Well, you know, we work with girls, and one of the things that we do with our girls is we don't water down anything. The girls learn about the SEC. They learn about fundraising guidelines. The girls actually take their their fundraising call sheet and their campaign appeal home and make phone calls. Um, and I always think of the Steve Martin quote, be so good they can't ignore you. If you are qualified and if you feel confident and if you really do know what you bring to the table, I just don't think you can, you, you've got to reach a point for yourself, and this could just be personal development, where you're not worried about what people think. Because when you run and then when you become a, an elected official, people are going to say all manner of things about you, um, and you've just got to decide for yourself that you belong there. And I think abilities and what you know and what you're what you're capable of doing go a long way to help build confidence. I personally, when I master a skill, I'm, I'm standing an inch taller, and I can watch the girls in our sessions and even the adults, even the women, when they get it and they acquire a skill and they get this inform, additional new information, you know, you can see them, you know, like grow an inch taller, and you can see them, you know, feel feeling more confident. And I watch candidates throughout the campaign become more and more confident. You know, um, just listening to Victoria and what she said, you know, clearly she was paying attention. Clearly she was very engaged in her race, um, and she knew the real actual mechanics um, of running. And you can hear that. The confidence comes through, you know. So I'm sure she feels mm -hmm. a thousand times more confident than she did when she started. Yes, and I, and I think it's important for candidates as you mentioned, Kimberly, to take ownership of the campaign. This is your campaign. Your name is on the ballot. If you feel like somebody is guiding you in the wrong direction, like Kimberly said, cut them if you need to, or you can stand up and say no. Like you are in control, even though you have a manager and a field team. You, This is your race. Um, I think women, to answer um, the other question, Shelly's question, um, women, we're qualified. We um, sometimes we underestimate ourselves, and if you just walk around um, here and just see other folks that were elected, I mean, it's you, you will be blown away. <laughs> how yeah. um, I just I just wonder how some folks got an offer. I know what you, I know exactly. I know what you're saying. I know. Listen, yeah. I know exactly what you're saying. I work with members yeah. of Congress, and I promise you, like when I start to work with them, or I'm sitting in committee, and I hear some of the things they say, or I watch them, and I'm going oh, my God, you really aren't that intelligent. And you're like, 
And I say to women, like, trust me, I'm telling you from having been there, and I would love to talk to you a month after you've served or two months after you've served, and I'm sure that you will see this. You're just like, wow. I mean, it's an, it's amazing. Some people get elected, and you're like, are you kidding me? Like, how <laughs> did you do that? <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, okay, well, ladies, we're out of time here, so I just want to thank everyone for joining us, and I just want to encourage everyone, either side of the aisle, whatever your beliefs are, we need more women in politics, and that's kind of what this was designed to encourage all women um, to run, because I do think that, as Victoria pointed out, the, the disparity is just astounding in 2017, and so I think we're all just kind of um, for the push for just more women in general. Um, <clears throat> you guys have any last closing comments? If anybody, our website is victoriafortexas.com. We're also on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. And I suggest this because the millennials convinced me to do it, get on Snapchat uh, to reach the young millennial generation <laughs> of voters. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Victoria. Um, and, yeah, and Kimberly is the Political Institute for Women. I know she has a great website also. So thank you, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Great. Thank you. This does conclude today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.